personal finance at the University of Houston at the Bauer College of Business. Getting just a little bit late start. Now I'm going to jump into Zoom and see if I can let my students in. Uh, here we go. I'm going to start the Zoom meeting now. If you're joining us on Facebook and the YouTube, uh, welcome. Welcome, welcome. I'm going to do a sound check here in just a minute and see if I can get uh, confirmation that I'm being heard out there on the internet. Welcome aboard. If you're joining us, I'm sorry I'm a couple of minutes late. We are ready to get started. If someone, <clears throat> excuse me, if someone could please let me know you can hear me either in the chat or just speak up. Just want to make sure that i am got my technology working. Can you hear me? Alejandra, can you hear me? Awesome. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. <clears throat> okay, we're going to talk about, well, we're going to talk about a couple of things. Today's lesson is on uh, tax allocation. So you'll see week number 11, we're jumping into tax allocation. So um, typically during this lesson, this lecture, I do a, uh, a video and I use three buckets, uh, but I don't have my three buckets handy there at my office at the University of Houston. So I'm going to give you, I'm going to post that video in your uh, YouTube playlist. And so I'll take the old video, one of the videos I did in a previous uh, semester and post that in your YouTube playlist. The, the lecture that I do on tax allocation really is just designed to help you understand uh, tax allocation, tax strategies. Remember, the uh, second law of personal finance is the law of tax advantaged investing. So it's a very important uh, element of building wealth. And I want to make sure you guys understand it. If you go back in your mind to the perfect investment, we talked about the uh, the perfect investment being the 401k and the company match where you get uh 100% match up to a certain percentage uh, once you decide to contribute your money from your paycheck into your 401k account. And so as I mentioned a couple of times when we went over the perfect investment, I helped you understand that your 401k was not technically an investment. And that is true. Your 401k is a type of of account. And so when you put your money into certain types of accounts, those certain types of accounts each have different rules, boundaries, and limitations. And so typically I use three buckets uh, to teach you what a little bit about how those rules and boundaries and limitations work. And there are really just three major buckets. One is just a taxable bucket. So I usually would have a big blue bucket and I'd show it to you and I would explain that if you invest, if you set up that type of account and you start making investments and let's say you make a ton of money because you were really smart and you bought Apple stock, but you bought it in this big blue bucket, then you would be paying tax every time you sold some Apple stock for a profit. And so that's not a bad thing. Um, some advisors would say that's actually a better way to build wealth. But I kind of believe, I believe that tax advantaged investing is a better way to build wealth. And so the three buckets are the tax advantage or the tax taxable, which means there's really no no limits on how much you can put into that taxable account, but there are no benefits, no real you know, rules, except you pay tax on your growth. So again, if you bought Apple stock back in 2009, uh, if you follow Apple stock, you could see how many times the, the stock did a reverse split. It's just gone up and up and up and up. And so Apple stock, you would have, you would have had 10 times your money. More than that, you would have had about 20 times your money. So if you would have invested a 
uh, $10,000 into Apple stock in a taxable account. Today, you would have, say, 20 times 10,000 would be $200,000. And then if you decided, okay, we have a recession coming, so I want to sell my Apple stock to take my gains, you'd have to turn around and pay taxes on $190,000 this year if you sold that stock this year. So that's a taxable account. And the reason that I like tax advantaged investing is because like I told you with your 401k, that the second bucket I would show you if I had my buckets handy is a big metal bucket. And the big metal bucket is your tax deferred bucket. So remember your 401k, in addition to being the perfect investment, your 401k was uh, a tax deferred type of account. And so that's what you're going to study this week. You're going to learn the difference between these three types of accounts. And you're going to see in your financial plan as you go into your tax allocation strategies that you have those three types of accounts already set up in your financial plan. And you have a little uh, uh, section in your plan that shows you what tax allocation you currently have. And so that's why you're going to be setting up these different types of accounts in your plan so that you have, number one, a taxable account, number two, a tax deferred account, and then the third bucket, the third type of account that I want you to be familiar with is a tax-free type of account, which is actually uh, the Roth IRA. So you're going to learn about those three types of accounts in uh, what you study this week, and uh, I'll like I said, I'll post that other video where I go over the three buckets. And if you want to watch that video, you can certainly watch it at double speed. If you're watching on YouTube and you're watching live, you don't have that benefit. But if you come back to the playlist later at missionalmoney.com or Money Study Group, you'll see the playlist. In fact, I'm I'm looking at the uh, I'm looking at the uh, little button right there. I don't think I, yeah, I can. So there we go. If you click on that button at missionalmoney.com, it should take you to our playlist. So I haven't put that video there yet as I speak at 10, 11 a.m. on, whoa, Tuesday, 1 November, year of our Lord, 2022. It's a new month. Wow. October went fast. The whole year has gone fast. So uh, that's, that's what you're going to study this week is tax allocation. And in your financial plan, you're going to be allocating tax allocation. You're going to be allocating some of your accounts to those three different categories, taxable, tax deferred, and tax free. And so you'll see how to do that when I post your assignment in Blackboard. And yet again, your capstone assignment is going to be part of, or it's going to include rather, the tax allocation strategy. So you will see uh, in one of the things I wanted to do today is uh, give you some feedback about your capstone review assignments. Many of you turned them in last night. Uh, so I have not yet graded those assignments. In fact, I'm leaving town. As soon as we finish this meeting, this Zoom meeting, I will be packing up to head to Phoenix for a conference. So I am uh, I'm having a little technical. See that little dot right there? I'm moving my mouse, and I have my iPad going. And somehow my mouse is on my iPad, so i got to get it back to, there we go. Sorry about that. Technology distraction. So I'm leaving town. I'll be gone until next week. So if, you're, if you turned your assignment in late, or not late, but um, last night, chances are I won't get to grade that assignment until next week. So just don't think I forgot about you. I'm going to be out of town. So for those of you who are here in the meeting and you heard what I just said, um, if you might want to post that in group me for some of the students who may be wondering why they didn't get a grade uh, yet. So I'm going to be leaving town. Uh, let me see. I've got some chat. Looks like I have a couple of questions or at least a question, and that's great. So if you do have a question, you can post it.
Um, uh, hey, Professor, this week's assignment, when we add the three investments, do we keep the 401k from last week in the investment tab? Yes, you do. To have a total of four investments in our portal. Thanks for your help. Uh, so, Regan, uh, that question, that's a great question. Um, but the 401k would be one of those. So in this week's assignment, you're going to be. So I think last week what you did uh, was create. I asked you to do a little research move your birthday so that you're 10 years older and that 401k account that you had set up that 401k should be funded then for 10 years and it was your job to figure out okay assuming that you get the job that you really want uh, and assuming that you know what the company match is at that company that you got the job and assuming that you know what your salary is and you know what the match is and you know that you're going to be contributing at least enough money to receive the full match. Hopefully that all makes sense because we've gone over it multiple times. And if that's true and you did the research, then you had to come up with some assumptions on how much would you have contributed to that 401k? If you made a hundred grand a year, if the company matched 10%, you're putting in 10%, that's $10,000. The company's matching it. So now you put in 20,000 that you didn't put in but your account value in your 401k for the first year would have been 20 grand. And so year two, same thing. And year three, same thing. And so if you made that assumption in your 401k, you've got a pretty good chunk of change in your 401k. And in addition to the contributions that you made and that your company made, you have to figure out some kind of I, you have to have some idea of how much it grew based on your asset allocation. And so that's what you were supposed to play with last week, just to get an idea of how asset allocation, which is in terms of investment strategies, remember, asset allocation is the single most important determinant of your portfolio's returns. So when you're talking about making investments inside of your 401k, how you allocate those assets will make a big difference in the returns. So there's no right answer. I'm not asking you to get it right or even close to right. I just want you to see that if you selected preservation of capital in your asset allocation versus aggressive, you're going to have a huge difference in the value of your investments over time. So those in investment strategies that I taught you last week become super critical in terms of your building wealth. But to answer your question, Reagan, it's you're going to have those three accounts. The 401k is one of the accounts and you've already got that built. So you don't really need to mess with that. Now you got to go in and set up a Roth IRA account, which you're going to learn about this week. You're going to learn how much can you contribute to that account. So you're going to do that. And then you're going to do the same thing. You're going to figure out, are you going to invest that in just cash with no growth? Or are you going to be smarter than that and use some kind of asset allocation, which will then produce a different kind of return? And again, these are experiments, research that I want you to do in your plan so that you can see how it works. So there's no right or wrong answer, except, it's, you know, it's if you want to move the needle, obviously asset allocation is one way to do that. So great question. Uh, I hope I answered it. Um, so I see Mario. Mario, I appreciate you asking the question here. I know we, you booked an appointment with me on Zoom to do a one-on-one. -on -one, and so I'm going to cover uh, a better approach, a better process for us to make sure that you get your questions answered and that everyone in the course gets their questions answered. So thank you for letting me cancel that appointment. I'm leaving town today, like I said, so I don't really have time to do the one-on-ones today. And I know some of you booked for next week to do that, and I'm going to cancel those Zoom appointments that are one-on-one -on -one for the purpose of getting help on your capstone. I'm going to go over a better way, a process that I think you will really like. There I go, sounding like Donald Trump again. You're going to really love this. Now, I really do. I think you're going to like this strategy, this process that I'm going to give you 
um, to get your questions answered so that everybody gets their questions answered and nobody has to feel confused or lost about your capstone assignment and making sure that you get the full 200 points. I'm going to make sure that every one of you has access to me and to the answers that you're looking for. So I think you're going to like this process, and I'll go over that in a minute, but I just wanted to mention Mario again. Thanks for letting me cancel our appointment. Okay, so let me see. I think I answered your question, Reagan. I hope so. Tell me if I if I didn't, and I'll continue to attempt to answer your question. Mario, I keep changing my age, income, expenses, as well as the retirement plan and my probability of such success has still not moved from 0%. What else would I have to do to move the needle? That's such a great question. And I promise you, Mario, and by the way, I looked at your, your points you have, you're, you're well on your way to earning an A. And just so you know, and so everyone else knows, while I gave you guys really good notice that you could have a 50 point deduction on your capstone assignment if you have excess money or if you're if you're not actually moving the needle is important but it's not something I'm going to hammer you on but here's what I am going to hammer you on in terms of deductions on your capstone if you go into your plan and there's something odd like you have 30 million dollars in the ending value and you don't even comment on that and you don't tell me what you did to try to figure out why you had such a high amount that's where you get the 50 point deduction but if you have a reasonably you know good plan and you go and you look at your cash flows you look at your expenses you look at all the things that I'm going to go over in this review uh, then and you still can't find it I'm not going to give you a big deduction for that. I might give you a little deduction. But what has happened in every semester is students just go in and they do their capstone and they don't pay attention to the fact that they have $125 million in the end of their plan. And it's like, that's just not acceptable. So for those of you who are concerned and you're asking questions and wanting to do a one-on-one, -on -one, I promise you, you're going to be fine. But anyway, I still want to I want to answer your questions because I want to make sure I do my job in teaching you how a financial plan works and how these projections work and what pieces of your financial plan will move the needle. And so I'm not trying to get you to be expert financial planners using the software at Right Capital. Um, you're doing a great job. Some of you are really super good at it and some of you are struggling a little. Don't worry about that. Just follow along and spend a few minutes and look into the places that I'm going to show you in this in this post that I'm that I'm giving you. Um, and thanks. I'll have a great trip, Reagan. OK, so that hopefully, Mario, I'm going to when you see the post that I put at missionalmoney.com, you're looking at it here. Capstone Help Wanted. I also posted this in Money Study Group. And so this is if you need help, this is where you need to go. Follow the instructions in this post. I'm going to go over it quickly in just a minute. But that's the answer to your question is I'll help you if you need help. But I first want you to go and review your plan and um, do what's outlined in this post right here. Uh, so, again, that's that's that. Um, and by the way, Mario, you're not alone. Moving the needle from the zero percent is a it's a big question. We always have it and we always answer it. So there's lots of reasons why you're not able to move the needle from zero percent. And I'll help you see what the common reasons are that your plan is not budging. Um, and then we can work from there. So, uh, uh, Thu has, hi, Professor, since we adjust 10 years, should we also adjust the balance amount of mortgage and car loan to show that we've already paid 10 years? That's a great question. And so the answer is, yeah, that'd be a good thing for you to do if you want your plan to be more accurate. But remember, um, for most of us, we're kind of making stuff up for the purpose of showing you how these different elements work in a financial plan. So, you know, we're pretending you're 10 years older to pay off, I mean, not to pay off, but to raise money in your 401k and your Roth IRA and so on. Um, but since that's not the reality, you're not 10 years older, you haven't contributed that. Remember, your plan is kind of 
uh, at this point theoretical. And so for that reason, um, I'm not asking you to go ahead and do those other things through. I'm not, if you want to do that, that's great. You can do that, but you do not need to do that. You will not get a single point deduction for not doing that. That's not part of the assignment. It's not part of the capstone. Again, I'm not trying to get you guys to be perfectionists in this financial planning process. I'm just trying to get you to learn and see how things work. And I think jumping into your financial plan and playing around with things is a great way to learn. So please don't feel like, you know, when you do your capstone, I'm going to you know, be hard on you. I just, that, that whole $125 million ending balance thing, that's just, that, that kind of makes me think you're, you're missing the whole point. And so if you're not missing the whole point, you've done great and you're not going to get deductions. So I didn't mean to scare everybody. I did mean to scare the students who are not paying attention, who are just putting numbers in and don't even have a clue that they have 125 or $1.2 billion at the end of their plan. It's like, that's what I'm trying to solve. But 98% of you are not, maybe, maybe 80% of you are doing just fine. And if you just comment and jump in your plan and do a little looking around, you will be fine. So thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. All right, cool. All right. So again, let me jump into this. <clears throat> I want to just show you, I posted this Mario really for you and Parker and a couple of other students who tried to book a, uh, a Zoom one-on-one -on -one because you're concerned about your grade. You're concerned about a deduction in your capstone. And I promise you, I'll do everything I can to help you get all the points you can in this course. By the way, if you have, let's say you have 500 points right now, and you can, if you have 450 or 560 or 600 or 350, you can take what I'm about to say and you can do a quick little math for yourself. Remember, you need 950 points to get an A. There is no such thing as an A plus at the Bauer College, so 950 points gets you an A. We're, we're doing... Uh, so you did assignment 10 last week. This week you're going to do assignment 11. I owe you one more assignment. I believe it's going to be the blueprint for financial success. I haven't even created that assignment yet. It's a new one for this semester, so I'm going to need your help. But that's two more assignments. So basically that's another 100 points. So if you have 500 points and you get this week's assignment and then next week assignment number 12, that's, that's 600 points, right? 500, if you have 500 now and you have two more, and that's without the early points of 10 points each. So just think about that. If you've got 500 points with another 100 points to come in basic, in regular assignments, that's 600. And then you get your 200 points of uh, class participation, that's 800. And then your capstone's worth 200, that's 1,000 points. So if you got a 50-point deduction on your capstone and you have 500 points right now, who cares? I mean, I want you guys to have to, to do, I want you to be able to spend your time on courses that are more intense, more challenging. This, this course is not intended to be difficult. I love what Warren Buffett says. He says, investing is not like Olympic diving. You don't get extra points for difficulty. <laughs> I love that quote. I'm not trying to make this difficult. I want to make it as easy as possible. I know there's a ton of stuff. You guys are doing a great job. But if you got 500 points, take a deep breath and trust me that you're going to be way ahead of the game pretty quick. So um, that's that. Okay, so let me see if we have any more for the article. Can it be more than the required? Yes, Elisa. I don't discount. I don't give you deductions for having too many words ever. I would appreciate if you didn't give me a 10,000 word copy and paste article. I probably would question that. But no, if you get a thousand points or I mean a thousand words or whatever, no problem. Uh, thank you. OK, so I think I answered all the questions and I just wanted to remind you, if you got 500 points and that you may have 450 points, but just know 950 is an A. You get 10 extra points when you turn them in early. If you've been doing that, you're probably way ahead of the game. If you got 600 points, you should be. I mean, if you have 600 points right now and many of you do, 
then you're going to achieve what I hoped all along you would be able to achieve, which is you'll be completely done with everything you need to do in this course. You will have your A and you'll be able to turn and focus your attention and your time on those courses that are more challenging, that have final exams. And that's been my hope every time, every semester I've taught this course. I don't want this to feel like it's one of those difficult courses. I want this to be a life-changing course, one that you learn some things that you can take with you for the rest of your life, but that you're going to have to continue to learn for the rest of your life. And I'm hoping we can be friends and stay in connection for a long, long time. And that's why I do this, create this content, put it on YouTube and Facebook and have courses that are available for you to continue your learning. So hope that helps. Now let me jump into this. This is new. Uh, I've been doing something like this kind of every semester, uh, especially since we've been asynchronous. But I want to go over this capstone help wanted. And you'll see this again in Money Study Group. I posted this. So it's going to be there when you get to this week's assignment. Well, actually, I posted it in session 12. So when you go to session 12, the capstone section, session. Uh, when you go there, you'll see this post. I'm not going to show it to you right now, but you can see it next time you're there. And I did put this in the caption. I said, before sending me an email and before booking a one-on-one -on -one Zoom meeting with me to get help on your capstone assignment, please review this post and follow these instructions, the instructions in this post. And I just said that because this is the process I think can help us help me help you, can help you help me help you. There you go, which is what I want to do. So <clears throat> that's what this post is. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to review this post and I want you to make a list of your specific questions. The fact that you can't move the needle, okay, great, but you're going to have to, if you're in that situation, just tell me what you've done. What are you, you looked at your expenses, you looked at your savings, you looked at your income, you looked at your goals. So that's what I want you to do. I want you to do a little examination of your financial plan before you reach out to me. I want you to grab a screenshot of each of those elements that are creating some question. Um, and I also want you to just do a little kind of you know, trial and error inside your own plan. And, you know, give me a screenshot if you find something that makes you question. And I will answer your questions and I'll help you uh, process through that. But I just need you to be very specific. So I want you to create an article and then I want you to send me an email. And in that email, just think about all the articles you've done this semester. When you do an article, you give me some narrative in this case, it will be your questions, your specific questions, and then screenshots showing me your plan so that when I get your email, I can jump right into your plan and I can create a little tutorial and that tutorial will be will benefit the whole class. So if you send me this email, please include my, your permission for me to use your assignment and use your plan to create a tutorial video that will benefit the entire course. And if you're not comfortable um, having me review your plan, then I would just suggest just sit back, wait for that tutorial video to come out. It'll come out. It'll probably be the end of next week, depending on how many emails you send me and how many assignments I, or how many plans I get to review in that tutorial. So that's what I'm going to do. Your emails and your questions, your specific questions will be the content that will fill the video that I'm about to do coming up in the next week or so to answer all of your questions. So um, this video or this this post has a few of the things that I would suggest you do and look at. So just review it. It's got an old video. I don't even remember which video this is, but it's the money. It's the capstone review video. So that's just there. If you haven't watched that, I would encourage you to do that. And again, if you're watching on the YouTube, uh, you can watch it at double time because I promise you, uh, I can't talk as fast as you can listen. In other words, you can listen at a much higher rate of speed than I can speak. And because of that, I, I always watch YouTube videos at double speed because it's just faster. <laughs> so feel free to do that. Um, anyway, this post just goes through 
all of the elements that we've been going through throughout the semester in the context of your financial plan, which are the same elements that are in your capstone assignment. So again, if you've done the assignments each week and you've you know, tweaked your plan each week, then when you get ready for your capstone assignment, assuming you got everything right, you should basically have full credit on your capstone assignment. But there are some things I want you to look at, like um, like in this case, you see this plan has $12,500. And so just do a little research, figure out why that is. And then also it's got... Uh, zero probability of success over here because I made some changes in this student's plan um, just because I wanted to show this student some things that I think were unreasonable. So for example, before making these changes and I made these changes, I went to action items and I made these changes in this student's plan. The student had retirement month, um, retirement monthly expenses of $1,000 or 2,000. I guess there, no, I'm not sure. Yeah. So there it is. You see 2,000. So in their current plan, before I made the changes, they had 2,000 a month. That's 24 grand a year in expenses. Yet they're making like, I don't know, a lot, a hundred and hundred grand a year. And they're telling their their plan says they're expecting they're going to live on two grand. That's their expenses, their monthly expenses. That's ridiculous. OK, that may not seem ridiculous to you because you don't have uh, the kind of budget that requires a twenty four thousand dollar annual burn rate. But in terms of a financial plan where you're making money and you have all these expenses like your house, internet, all of the things that'll be part of your actual expenses down the road, 2000 a month is a ridiculously low amount of expenses. Trust me on that. Ask someone who owns a home, has some kids, drives some cars or whatever. So I changed that and that's why this plan then went to zero probability of success. And I didn't do much research. I just changed a couple of things. Same with the pre-retirement living expenses. This student said they're only going to be spending a thousand. That's twelve grand a year. And I said, well, let's change that to seven grand. Doesn't mean it's the right number. It's a different number. It's a more reasonable number, in my opinion. But you know, so if this is your plan, I think this is Simri. Simri, if this is your plan, you're going to want to go back and do whatever you want to do in your plan. I just wanted to show an illustration. So this is what I'm looking at when I look at your capstone assignment. And if it's reasonable, like if that number was $3 million and your probability of success was 45 and you gave me some comments in your capstone to say, here's what I did. I'm not sure, whatever. Uh, I'd be fine with that. You wouldn't get deductions. It's just if you have some really obvious mistakes and you don't even mention them, you don't even discuss them, then you're going to get deductions. So here's another thing I would say. If you haven't been doing this, I just give you a little pointer to go to cash flow, cash flows. This is where I go. If you ask me to review your plan, I go to cash flows because that's where... It, all of the behind the scenes details about your plan shows up in cash flows. Just like in real life, if you're um, doing financial planning of any kind, it's in the cash flows. Think about it. If you're a company, if you have a household, where's the money going? If you know where the money's coming in and where it's going out, that's called cash flows. And my job as a financial planner is to help clients have the most accurate picture of their financial life as possible. And in doing that, that's one of the reasons, by the way, just as an aside, that's one of the reasons that I'm so much a proponent of linking all of your accounts. Now, again, as we discussed at the beginning of the semester, your students, you're doing this for a grade. Linking your account seems way personal and way too much information. And that's fine. Don't link your accounts. But think about it this way. If you were an actual person, 
<laughs> and I know you are actual people, but if you were an actual um, consumer, if you were paying me to help you with a financial plan, then you would want, I would hope you would want to have your plan be as accurate and real life as possible. And one of the best ways to do that is to have real live feeds of all of your accounts, including your credit cards and your bank and your credit union and your investments, because then your financial plan becomes a very clear and accurate kind of always up to date in real time snapshot of your financial life. That's what a financial plan is designed to be. That's one of the things it's designed to be. Because then as we start to look at goals, as we start to look at prioritizing prioritizing different goals and different commitments, then we get to see a much more clear trajectory of where you will be if you make this decision versus that decision. If you save more money in a taxable account or if you take advantage of that perfect investment, all of these things can show up in your financial plan if you're you know, again, assuming that you're a real consumer 10, 20 years from now, when you're ready to start to look at different choices you can make in your financial life. So um, that's where it all shows up is cash flows in real life, in real financial planning. Cash flows are critical. So uh, something you want to look at in your financial plan, because it'll give you a picture of uh, what you're looking at. So I'm going to scroll down. I think I have a screenshot. Oh, I thought I had a screenshot of a cash flow. Um, somewhere in this plan, though, I found, I guess I, yeah, here we go. So this is the same plan, by the way, with a zero probability of success. And when you jump into your cash flows, you're going to see the same basic stuff. But in this case, I don't even know what this $300,000 goal is. I'm assuming, I'm not sure what it is. I could assume, but you know what happens when you assume. Um, but at any rate, at age 33, and remember this student already fast forwarded their age, so they're 32. And then a year after that, they have this goal that is costing them 300 grand. Now, again, I did not go into the plan to figure out what is this 300 grand. It's something I want you to do when you look at your cash flows. If you see a big number like that showing up in any of these columns, you can see that that puts your net flows at 300. You can't really see that because it's kind of blurry, but. So now this student's plan is saying that they're down in one year, they're down to negative $349,000. And that's going to require a pretty significant catch up if they want their plan to be successful. In other words, if they want their probability of success to increase, this issue right here, this $300 hiccup or whatever you want to call it, is a really heavy weight in this financial plan. So you may have something, you've added a goal, you may have done something in your plan that you didn't realize, and that's fine, that's great. I want you to experiment all you want, but if you're having trouble moving the needle, I want you to take the initiative and jump into your cash flows so that you can see what's going on in your plan, because again, if I jump in your plan to try to help you, that's the first place I'm going to go. And that's typically the, the best way to figure out what's going on in your plan in terms of moving the needle. So I hope that helps. Um, so that's that. That is the capstone help wanted. And I also want to mention a couple of things. I got a couple of announcements. Uh, remember the CFP event? I posted that. Uh, I posted that last week. Um, it's They still have openings. So a couple of things I wanted to mention about that. So if you're interested, if you think maybe financial planning is something you want to do, I think I said I'd give you 25 points extra credit to go to the event. And it's posted again on missionalmoney.com. I should pull that up if I can find it. Um, let me pull it up over here first so you don't have to watch me. I'll see if I can do that while I'm 
Um, sorry, I'm I'm trying to get I'm trying to find this post so that I can tell you the date again. Um, but if you're thinking about being, uh, you know, in the financial services business, or if you've ever thought about that, or if you might be thinking about that, I would encourage you to check that out. The event. Um, <laughs> I'm having trouble finding the post. I know where it is. Um, it's November 4th. So let me copy this link and see if I can put it in. Uh, so yeah, November 4th, I'm gonna pop it in here and see if we can look at it real quick. Uh, it's, it's November 4th. <clears throat> So another thing I wanted you to know is I'm looking for an intern. I haven't I have not announced this yet, but I wanted to announce it to you because some of you are just doing such a great job um, in your own financial plan that I can see that you you know you have uh, you have the skills, and maybe it's intuition, maybe it's you just like it. I don't know. But it, for some of you, I think there's a pretty good opportunity to, you know, jump into a pretty cool, I think, a pretty cool career path, which is financial planning. And so this CFP event that I'm not seeing, it's not showing up on my iPad. Give it a minute. Eh, it's still not showing up. Uh, it's a good way for you to get exposed. Here we go. Just showed up. So I think you can see it now. I'm having a little trouble paying attention to too many things. So this is on missionalmoney.com. But it, it's a pretty cool event. Um, we would love to see the place be full. It's not full right now. So if you're interested, I wanted to encourage you to check this out on November 4th. And... Um, I'll give you 25 points if you do. Just send me an email. Or actually, if you do go to the event, take some good notes and just post it in the message next time you submit an assignment, and I'll give you 25 points. But what I really wanted you to think about, some of you, not all of you, and I'll just make this brief, um, but I'm going to be hiring an intern to help me work on financial plans. I have hundreds of financial plans that I'm working on. And someone who can jump in and do a little diagnostic is what I do all the time. It's kind of fun if you like doing it. Um, and you, if you like working with people, I'll teach you how to do that too. I'll teach you every part of the business that you want to learn. It'll be a very unique internship opportunity. So I wanted to just kind of start kind of start to announce it here. I know this is going live on Facebook and YouTube. So this will be a remote position there. You don't have to show up at the office. You will be, um, you know, you'll be working remotely because that's the way it works. You don't have to be in the office to do the kind of work that you will do as this intern. And it will be a paid internship. So the pay will be based on, um, you know, basically the scope of your role. And that scope is still being worked on. In other words, you know, which parts of the business do you want to be in involved in? There's so many pieces to this amazing business. And like I said, I'll teach you the things that you want to learn in this internship. It will be a wealth care specialist, I think is what it's going to be. But your primary, one of the primary things you'll need to do is know how to diagnose a financial plan, like add data, just like you've done in your own financial, in, in this semester, you've built your financial plan. Imagine if you had a job where you were just working with people all day, um, helping them get their financial plan accurate. That's really what this internship will be for. It's not so you won't be selling, you won't be, um, you know, you won't be responsible for making recommendations. But the beautiful thing about this internship, in my opinion, the beautiful thing about this internship is that you will have the opportunity to learn all of those things because I'll be working really closely with you on a plan by plan basis where you'll get to see how we construct a plan, 
And all you have to do is, it's, it's really pretty easy. You just get the information. I'll tell you what information we need, and you will learn how to gather that information from clients and from prospective clients as well. So it's a great opportunity if you think that this is um, you know, a career path you might want to follow. So like I said, I haven't mentioned this to anybody yet. Um, but I'm mentioning it to you. So if you're interested, you know how to reach me and I'll let you know what I need from you to move forward in the interview process. But for now, it's like if you're getting an A in the course and you uh, have done a reasonably good job in your own plan, then you will be top of my list. So I appreciate you letting me make this announcement. So it's now 1048. I'm going to tell you that... Um, we are going, you, not we, well, we, we're in this together. But this week, you're going to be focusing on tax allocations. So basically, again, I'm going to tell you a little story real quick about um, why tax-advantaged investing is one of the three laws of personal finance. Because as you jump into your studies this week about tax allocation, tax strategies, I just want you to know why it's so important to me. I think you know, I've mentioned before that I uh, was born on April 15th, which is tax day. And my first child was born on December 31st, which is the last day you can actually have a child and still receive the tax benefit of the tax deduction. And when I had my first child, I want to say there was a $1,250 tax credit per child, which means basically you get $1,250 cash almost. It's, it's a credit. It's it's money in and that was that meant a lot to me. I was still a college student. So I was pretty impressed with my ability to do financial planning in that way by making sure that my first child was born on the very last day of the year. Actually, that was just totally coincidence, but it is an important piece of the puzzle tax deductions, that is, an important piece of the puzzle. And since I was born on April 15th, and since my first child was born on the last day of the year and received that full deduction, and then my second child was born on October 15th, which is the date, the deadline for filing corporate taxes, all of those things combined made me feel pretty good about my calling to be a financial planner. <laughs> and then when I became a certified financial planner and I was a State Farm agent at the time, I had a client. He wasn't a client. He was a friend. His name was J.D. J.D., I don't know if you're watching. Probably not. But J.D. and I coached Little League together. And uh, J.D. lived in a small house just like I did. He drove an old minivan just like I did. We took our kids to Little League and we coached together. And then later on, I became a State Farm agent and a certified financial planner. And here comes J.D. into my office and he wanted some help with his financial plan. He said, I see you're a certified financial planner, Jim. And I trust you. I know you. I like you. And I just wanted to get a second set of eyeballs on my financial life because I've been doing it on my own, he said. And I think I'm doing OK, but I just I, I don't know. I don't know what I don't know. Would you be would you be willing to do a financial review for me? And so I'm like, sure. So we made an appointment. He came into my office. He brought his file you know, his financial statements, and he laid them down on my desk. And I started to go through them as we do in financial review meetings. And I was like, dude, you're a millionaire. Now, I think I told you what my favorite book, you know, when I was in college, the book that inspired me was called The Millionaire Next Door. Because in that book, The Millionaire Next Door is described as someone you would never guess is a millionaire because they live way below their means. In other words, they have a lot of money, but they don't spend it on things to impress people. They save it. They're very frugal and they like to buy used cars. That was one of the major elements of The Millionaire Next Door. And when I read that book, I thought, I'm a master mechanic. I like buying used cars. So that I got that going for me. 
And so at any rate, I read that book in college and it was the first time in my life that I ever even dreamed that one day I might be able to be a millionaire. Now, trust me, being a millionaire today versus when I was in college is not as not nearly as big a deal. The same is true for you. For you to be a millionaire by the time you're my age is really not a big deal. Because a million dollars today, and when you're my age, a million dollars will be worth a whole lot less than it was back when I was in college. That was a much bigger deal, you know, 40 years ago to be a millionaire than it is today. But the alternative, regardless, the alternative for you to not become a millionaire by the time you're 50, which is the goal of this course, the alternative is to be in debt to live paycheck to paycheck. So even though it's not as big a goal, I think it's a really good goal. And that's why I want to encourage you to do everything you can to become a millionaire by the time you're 50. And JD's story is one of the things that inspired me in this course to make sure that we focused on the second law of personal finance which is the law of tax advantaged investing because JD laid out his stuff. And when I'm like, dude, wow, how'd you become a millionaire? He's like, well, here's what he told me. And this is the law of tax advantaged investing. I got it straight from JD, my friend who I coached with, who lived in a small house, drove an old minivan and made decent money. His wife didn't work. He had three kids And he was a lot like me and he was the millionaire next door and he inspired me. And I hope his story inspires you. Here's what his story was. He said, Jim, when I started working at Lockheed Martin, I had no idea anything about investing, but I decided that I would go ahead and invest in the 401k because it was available. And he said, the IRS made this rule that you could only put so much money in your 401k. And J.D. said, you know what I thought to myself, self, if the IRS is making a rule that you can only put so much money in your 401k, there must be a pretty good deal. So I want to put as much money into my 401k as I can because it's a rule. I can't put more in, so I might as well put that much in. Okay. It's kind of like, what I taught you about the perfect investment. I want you to put in at least as much as you get the match for, because I don't want you to leave that money on the table. But JD's approach was different. JD said, I'm going to put as much in as they will let me. And so he said, I did that. I started out of college, got the job. I started doing that and I just lived and I spent the rest of the money. But when I got a raise, I would try to save a little bit more. He said he didn't change his lifestyle. And every time he got a raise, the IRS, not every time he got a raise, but over time, the IRS kept increasing the amount of money that you were allowed to put into your 401k. And so he said, I would just increase my contribution every time that happened. He said, over time, it worked out pretty good. And then he said in 1998, in January, I believe, in 1998, they came out with this thing called a Roth IRA. And he said, seemed like a good thing. Again, they had a limit. You could only put so much money into the Roth IRA. So he said, that's how much I put in. And over time, they increased the amount I was able to put in. And every time they increased it, I would put that much more in. I always wanted to fill up those tax deferred and tax-free accounts because that was the the limit that I could put in is what I wanted to put in. So I always did that. And on top of that, my wife, who doesn't have any earned income, she's allowed to fund her Roth IRA because she qualifies as a spouse. She gets to qualify with my earned income. So we did that too. Starting When they started the Roth IRA in January of 1998, we started to contribute to both my Roth IRA and my wife's Roth IRA, and we did it every year. And when they increased the amount that we were allowed to contribute, we increased the amount that we did contribute. That was his plan. That's what he did. That was it. 
He said, when I get a raise or a bonus, I would try to find a good way to invest it. But he said, I don't know what I don't know. I'm not sure if I'm doing the best things I can do for my financial future. So that's what set the table for our conversation about JD's financial plan. From there, we talked about what are his goals? What's his vision for his future? What does he want out of his life? Because JD and his wife had done the things they needed to do to be in a position where they had lots of options. And so it was my pleasure and my privilege to get to help them create a financial plan that was meaningful for them for their lifetime. And, and I was all along the process very impressed seeing this millionaire next door and how he did it. And he, again, JD is the one who um, inspired me to have, remember the story about Sam, my friend from Ireland, the engineer who passed away a few years ago, when I told him I was going to be teaching this personal finance course at U of H, he said, Jim, there's one thing you got to teach him. There's one thing that's more important than anything. And that is the law of spending and saving. You got to spend less than you earn so that you can save more. He said, Americans, your culture, this culture, they don't get that. They need to get that. You got to teach them that. And so that was the first law of personal finance. But that wasn't it for me because I was born on April 15th, tax day, because I knew about tax deductions, because I was a certified financial planner and I saw the power of tax advantaged investing I had to add that as a law as well. And I got that law from my friend JD. And then the third law of personal finance is the law of purpose and commitment. Because I know, just like you know, if you have no real clear purpose for your life, if your life is just a random day by day, do whatever the culture pushes you to do, and you spend whatever you want to spend because it feels good or you want to impress people, if you live that kind of life with no real clear purpose and no commitment to do things differently, to do things that make sense, that move you closer to your purpose and your goal, if you live that life without clear purpose, without a real commitment, you're going to end up where most people end up. And so those are the three laws of personal finance that I hope to, you know, implant in you for the rest of your life. This week, you're going to learn about tax allocation. But again, I want you to think about JD's story and how it worked for him. It worked super, super simple. And your just your 401k, if you just follow those four investment strategies that I taught you, diversification, asset allocation, dollar cost averaging, remember Farmer Joe, and then asset uh, uh, re portfolio rebalancing. Those are the four investment strategies. In addition to the perfect investment, if you just do those five things, you will set yourself on a path, a quick, fast path to success in building wealth. And so by doing that, your 401k, you're doing the tax advantaged investing. And you're already doing the saving, you know, the, the law of spending and saving. And you're already doing the purpose and commitment thing because you commit, you make up your mind before you even start working that when the day comes and you sit down with HR and they say, do you want to contribute to your 401k? Your answer is already made up, of course. And how much do you want to contribute to your 401k? because you're smart enough to know how much the match is, you've already made up your mind. That's at least how much you're going to contribute to get the full match. And then when they ask the question, how do you want to allocate the assets in your 401k? You will not be clueless. You will not be confused. You will not be anxious. You'll be like large cap, small cap, international bond. Let's start there. And you might want to be even smarter than that, but that's just fine. Four quadrants, and then you're going to rebalance that bad boy every six months, every year, whatever. And you're going to dollar cost average into that 401k. And you're going to see those investments grow over time. And when we have really ugly times in the market, 
like we will have in your investing career, you'll take a deep breath and you'll go, I'm doing exactly what I need to do to maximize my returns, to minimize my risk, to build wealth so that when I get to the point where I'm 50, 60 years old, I will have lots of options, just like my friend JD. And like me, too, thanks to some really wise friends who I got to know along the way and changed my ways. <laughs> so I hope that helps. That's this lecture. And if you have any questions, I'll hang around and answer your questions. We're out of time. Thanks for listening to my sermon and for listening to the lecture. If you're on Facebook or YouTube, please leave your comments below. I'm going to jump into the Zoom meeting and say goodbye. I don't see any questions. So I'm going to jump over and just end the uh, broadcast on Facebook and YouTube. And then I'm going to come back. And I'll, if you have a question in the Zoom room, please leave it now. We're fixing to...